Ok, gràcies, Carme. Bon dia a tothom. És un plaer estar aquí. Gràcies per la invitació a venir i gràcies als organitzadors de l'Institut de Cosmociències. Com ha dit Carme, la meva àrea d'expertisa és en els exoplanets. Vam fer una nova en la notícia perquè vam anunciar la descobrida d'un planeta molt prop del planeta que anomenem el Barnard Star B, o Barnard B per curt. So today I'm going to discuss some general ideas about exoplanet finding, uh, the limitations and so on, also uh, the discovery of Barnard B and the data we had and how we analyzed it. And uh, at the end, I'd like to make, to put everything in context and uh, give a brief account of the next uh, steps in this field that should eventually bring us to closer to finding a true Earth twin. So I'd like to start with uh, very general ideas Um, some of the questions that we are ask as scientists are the same questions that people ask themselves, let's say, and not now for centuries. And a question like, are we alone in the universe? Are there other planets out there? Are they habitable? Are they actually inhabited? And can we go to them uh, eventually? Right? So these are questions that, that leave no one indifferent. And we try to seek answers to these for the benefit of, every, of, of humanity. So some of these questions already have answers, and we've found lots of exoplanets out there. And we are in for the last, I would say, for one more revolution here. And you know that four, 400 years ago, there was a revolution, the Copernican Revolution, in which we realized that the Earth was not the center of the universe. Now we're in for a new revolution, a revolution meaning that we as humans, as humanity, as, as the only inhabited planet in the universe, uh, will find our context in the inhabited universe. We just don't know what the answer may be. We're not, we don't know whether we are alone or not, but we try to find places that could potentially be uh, hosts to life, and we try to investigate and try to find signs for this life. And eventually, we'd like to announce, and I'm, I'm quite positive that this will be the case, that we have found uh, life elsewhere in the universe. So let me start with, by explaining how we do find planets out there. And it's, it's not so easy. So finding planets is complicated just because we're facing a very big contrast problem, right? It would be ideal to go and take a picture of a star and find a nice, uh, a nice system of planets surrounding this star. But let's go and let's go to a very nearby object to take an example. This is a sort of a sun-like star, uh, Tau Ceti. That's a G8 star, a bit cooler than our sun, at a distance of nearly 12 light years. So this is really around the corner. And this is a picture of the sky, which we don't see very well here, but with a full moon here at scale. So if we decide to go closer and try and see planets in this picture, we can uh, zoom in a bit 
and the planetary system is already there. We have put a planet, I've drawn a planetary system in this at scale uh, of our own solar system. So we keep going in this image. We are now completely buried in this, uh, the light of the star. And as we go closer and closer, we find this little tiny planetary system, which is our own planetary system to scale there. And our eight planets occupy a tiny fraction of the sky at that scale. Not only that, it's not only the problem with the scale, it's also the problem with the contrast. So if we take the Earth as an example and we compare this to the Sun, out of a billion photons from the star, one comes from the planet, from our own Earth. So from today's technology, it's actually impossible to go and take a picture, remove 99.999, a number of 9% of the light, and then just see the tiny planet that's surrounding, that's orbiting that star. The reason we don't... Well, this, it's because we cannot do this that astronomers have come up with indirect ways to find planets. So these days, we don't find planets in general, there's exceptions. By taking pictures of stars, we find planets by observing stars and seeing how they are affected by the planetary system that surrounds them. So we can distinguish a number of indirect techniques here. The Doppler technique, radio velocities, which I'm going to explain in a minute. The transit technique, I'm not going to use, uh, I'm not going to give a lot of examples here, but it's essentially it's as easy as explaining that this is a, an eclipse. It's when a planet comes in front of a star and the star is a little bit less luminous, less bright. Or astrometry, there is not a single astrometric discovery of exoplanet yet, but this is due to change. Uh, the Gaia space mission should announce, hopefully in the next couple of years, discoveries of planets using astrometry, which means that we're seeing the star move and the plane of the sky because it, there's a, a planet orbiting it. And there's more, a more fancy method, a more tricky one, that's gravitational lensing, in which we use the general relativity to probe the area around a so-called lens star, uh, and we are using the light of a background star. Using this technique, we can see whether this lens star is surrounded by planets indirectly. But this is a, a snapshot. We don't see this planet ever again. We see this microlensing event, and that's it. We measure it, and we don't see the planet ever again. And I said before that we cannot take pictures of planets uh, directly, but we actually can. Uh, there's a number of discoveries, of order of 20, that are direct images of planets. But I, I'm a bit skeptical about calling them planets, actually. Uh, this is a picture of a star in which 99.9% of the light has been removed, and there's these three little dots here that are the planets around this star. This is a very young object, and this, this surrounding, these orbiting planets are really massive, of 10, 15 Jupiter masses, and these are the limit of being called brown dwarfs. So we can do, we can take direct images, but only of very specific kinds of planets. Ooh, <laughs> this went dark. <laughs> OK. Now I'm going to home in on one of these methods, method of Doppler spectroscopy or radial velocities, and this is because this is the method we've used to find the planet around Barnard star. Now, just uh, physics 101, this is, the, uh, this is uh, the motion of an unseen planet around a star. And as you can all see, of course, both systems, both objects, uh, orbit around a common center of mass. So while the, the planet moves around the star, so does the star around a common very center. And then if we are able to measure the velocity of this star with some technique, then this wobble, this back and forth, this motion back and forth can reveal that there's a planet that we don't see orbiting that star. So sure enough, what we do is we use the Doppler method, the Doppler effect. Uh, we measure the precise positions of lines, stellar lines on the spectra, and by uh, uh, across time, then we can see the star is coming towards us or moving away from us. And this is the kind of data that we get, in, not data, the, the representation we get a if we plot velocity over time, we see this uh, wobble coming back and forth that this reveals that there's this planet uh, orbiting. So let me go a bit deeper here. Uh, this is the spectrum of our own sun, and this is the kind of uh, data that we use to find planets using the Doppler method. There's lots of, you can see the different colors that's uh, plotted in this way to make it prettier, but you can see lots of uh, vertical, these vertical lines, and, oh sorry, these darker bands here, and these are usually atomic lines in the spectrum of the planet, of the star. So we use these lines as markers for the wavelength. So by monitoring how this wavelength changes over time, then we can see how the star moves as well. So if we go to this, so take a 
a cut of this spectrum, this is the kind of data that we use. These are these, uh, these uh, normalized flux relative to one, and each of these uh, lines here corresponds to uh, atomic species, usually ionized or, uh, or, uh, or neutral, and these transitions uh, absorb most of the lines, and then they go deep, uh, uh, sufficiently deep, and then one can monitor, monitor the exact wavelength position of these lines. Fortunately, there's lots of lines on the stellar spectra, sp especially if the lines are, uh, if the spectrum is similar to a sun-like star. In early type uh, uh, stars, this becomes very tricky. For, let's say, B-type stars, A-type stars, there's not so many lines, and this technique doesn't work so well. But for sun-like stars and later, and um, cooler, there are so many lines that one can use to monitor uh, the radio velocity. So let me zoom in in one of these lines here. And this would be the deepest part of this line, right? So this is the normalized flux going to 0.34 uh, respect to 1, so 30%. This is wavelength in hundreds of an angstrom. And each of these nodal points, it's a measurement of the flux at this specific point, right? So now this, I've plotted this at 0 meters per second. Right? Now I'm going to move the spectrum, the inner part, this, uh, this uh, uh, black line inside, by 3 meters per second. 3 meters per second is the minimum we need to find planets. We mostly do, these days, about 1 meter per second. And this is what we need to do to find planets uh, with this technique. So just, just uh, keep an eye on this. So there you go. I, I moved the, uh, the line by 3 meters per second positive. Right? You can see the reference now. Right? So this is the kind of measurements we have to obtain to find planets by the radio velocity technique. So this is really challenging. And this is challenging enough, but then when you put the actual measurements of the spectrum, uh, this is it, right? So we have fluxes that have a specific error bar, and within these measurements, we have to be able to, to measure these tiny changes, these tiny shifts in the line because of the presence of a planet. So it's a big technological challenge that was not resolved into the, the early 1990s. Uh, that's when people started building spectrographs that would be able to do these kind of very precise measurements. So just to put everything in a bit more context here, this is the, now we are at the era of the one meter per second precision. Actually, there's one instrument that was commissioned a few months ago, and it's now almost operational, that's called Espresso, that can do 10 centimeters per second, that can do 10 times better than this. But already one meter per second is extremely challenging. So one meter per second change in velocity, this is two hundreds, or sorry, two tenths to the minus five angstrom shift in wavelength. Or, conversely, 15 nanometers on the detector. Nanometer, so that means that the line is shifted on the detector by about 15 nanometers. Or, one one thousandth of a pixel. So we're seeing changes in this line, in the position of this line, by one thousandth of the size of the framework that we have measuring, that we are measuring of the pixel. Or, 30 silicon atoms. So we're seeing changes in the line by about 30 silicon atoms. Well, how can we do this then? This is really physically impossible, next to physically impossible. The thing is that this we don't do for one line. We do for thousands of lines at a time. And all lines of the spectrum have to move at the same velocity because of the whole star is moving at this velocity. So we can improve very much the precision by which we measure the position of these lines because we use many lines uh, to get this actual very precise radio velocity shift. In any case, this is still challenging from the, from the uh, technological point of view, and we have to stabilize these instruments in vacuum. We have to stabilize them to a precision of, of one millikelvin, and it's actually uh, and, and tiny pressure changes as well. So we need a very strong pressure and temperature control, and these are marvelous instruments that are this is a picture of the HARPS instrument, that is a famous one. This is a vacuum tank, this is the optical bench, this is the optical elements. You close this, you turn everything on, and you don't touch it ever again. So, uh, because any alteration would completely screw up your measurements. So HARPS has been closed now for 10 or 15 years, and it should remain closed for a few more decades to be able to use it. There's one instrument of this sort that we have built. Uh, Karma mentioned this. This is the Carmenes instrument. That's a consortium of 11 institutions in, in Spain and Germany. And uh, we have been actively working on this. And this is an instrument that is, in, at, is installed at the 3.5 meter telescope in Calaralto, in Almeria. And this Carmenes instrument can do one meter per second. 
and can do one meter per second in actually two different channels. It covers from the optical to the near infrared. So these are real pictures of the vacuum tanks. And you have to imagine in here, this is a vacuum tank, uh, completely temperature stabilized and pressure stabilized. And you have to imagine optical bench here. There's light coming in through a fiber, or more than one fiber actually. This light enters the spectra. There's the shell grating, there's the, all the optical elements, and there's the detector that is actually here. And this detector receives this, this spectra, and one has to be careful enough so that there's no shifts uh, of less than, of more than one thousandth of a pixel, actually, which is uh, pretty amazing. Now, coming back to, to generalities on planets, where, where are we in terms of planet finding? And I think we are amazed at what we found so far. Uh, this is, you know, there's been lots of radio velocity measurements over history. There's been transit missions uh, already flying in the past, and now they're flying as well. And this means that we have found mostly uh, almost 4,000 exoplanets uh, today. Of course, this is a very strongly biased sample. We only find planets that are the right inclination, that are massive enough, and so on. But you can debias the data that we have, and by debiasing, we can calculate or estimate what is the fraction of stars with at least one planet. And this is only for short period planets. These are planets of less than 50 day periods. And even here, the numbers are huge, right? This is 0%, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25%, and categorized in different planet sizes, Earth, super Earth, mini Neptunes, large Neptunes, gas giants. So even in this case, you see numbers here. Earths are 16%, 20% super Earth, 20% mini Neptunes, and so on. If you integrate everything, you get to a number of at least half of the stars that we see have planets of some kind. So one thing that you, we could wonder whether planet formation was something common. Now we know that this is the most common thing, right? So when a star is formed, the most natural thing to happen is that that star forms also a planetary system around it. Around it. And therefore, the abundance of planetary systems in the universe is really high. And there's some people that think that it's closer to 100%. If you go to the really low mass stars, to the so-called M dwarfs, there's the number of, the average number of planets per star approaches two. So on average, there's two planets per star all along. So that means planets are ubiquitous and, and very common. If we try and plot them in this kind of diagram, this is, oh, actually, this is the separation uh, between the star and the planet in astronomical units. And this is the mass of the planet in, in Earth masses. And you can see at 1, 1, there's our Earth. There's our solar system planets here. And all these little dots here are planets found using different techniques. In blue, this is the uh, Doppler technique, the radial velocities. In red is transits. Here in orange, that's the direct images, the pictures. And in green, there's the gravitational lensing uh, method here. So this is this almost 4,000 exoplanets that we have today. And already this plot shows a lot of information. There's a lot of things to be learned here. Uh, these are the Jupiters as our in our, so uh, these are Jupiter analogs, let's say, big planets in farther out orbits. These are the so-called hot Jupiters. There's not very much in between, so it's either the planets form and stay where they are, or they migrate inwards and they uh, end up very close to the star. There is a shortage of intermediate mass planets, so something more massive than Saturn, no, I mean more massive than Neptune and less massive than Saturn. There's some a relative shortage here, and this is interpreted as when a planet forms, it grows, and it grows when it grows beyond some critical mass, let's say, then it accretes lots of additional mass and grows uh, to be a, a super, I mean, a giant planet. So there's very little planets in this area. And you see a lot of a, a big abundance of what we call super Earths and hot super Earths. These are the planets for now that are most common in our samples. These are planets that are one, two, three, five times more massive than our Earth. And they, are, they make up most of the majority of the planets that have been found so far. And many of them are very hot. What should leave you a bit worried is that our solar system does not exist in the universe, right? There's no dots where we are, right? Uh, the only one, the only planet that gets closer, that's Jupiter. Uh, there's no dots here close to Earth, Ven Venus, and so on and so forth. Well, this is just an observational bias. We think that there's lots of planets in this area. Nature produces lots of small things, but it's just that this is a detection bias that we, our techniques, 
are a lot better finding close-in massive planets than they are finding, let's say, further out low-mass planets. So we expect that this will be filled in. But then, also take into account that 20 years after the first exoplanet was found, we are still not able to find a true Earth analog. We cannot, with these techniques, we cannot find planets like our own Earth. This will change probably in the next decade or so. There's, there's experiments that should fix this. So all this, actually, if we take a, a drawing of our Milky Way galaxy, all these, most of these 4,000 planets, except for the few microlensing ones, are in the immediate neighborhood of our own solar system. This is an area with a radius of 5,000 light years. So uh, uh, a bit over 1,000 parsecs or so. So that's the, uh, that's the area we've been finding planets here, and from that we can extrapolate. So we keep going in. This is the, our neighborhood, uh, uh, the, the, our hunting ground for planets so far. But if we go even closer, we are really interested in our immediate neighbors. These are the planets that we can find and investigate and study to, be, to best detail. So in our immediate eight, eight light years of radius, there's about 3,000 stars that are the most interesting for many reasons, for many applications, because we can then study in, in a great uh, deal of detail. And even though, even, even going closer, uh, our immediate neighbors, our next door neighbors, become of uh, big interest. I'm sure, I mean, this is a plot of our solar system, uh, sorry, of our immediate neighborhood. This is the sun, the Oort cloud, roughly at one light year, two light years, four light years, we have Proxima Centauri and Alpha Centauri A and B. You know that Proxima Centauri, there was a planet announced uh, a couple of years ago, so we know that there's one there. And this is Barnard Star. This is the next, plan the next star out uh, in this, uh, in this uh, increasing distance from the Sun. Barnard Star is 1.8 parsecs, uh, almost six light years of distance, and has the peculiarity of being the star on the sky with the largest apparent motion. It's the star that moves faster in our sky. It's about 10 arc seconds per year, so it's a huge or a, a very fast velocity, very fast speed. In only a couple of centuries, it, it travels as much as the diameter of the full moon. So it's really moving fast. You know, Barnard Star has also been uh, very interesting in the point of view of planet hunting. And in 1969, there was the announcement of planets around this star, one of the first announcements of planets by Peter van de Kamp using astrometry. But this was later disproved. Uh, only a few years afterwards, it was shown that the telescope that Van de Kamp was using had uh, changed the mirror, had changed some instruments, uh, some of the uh, uh, equipment, and that meant that this uh, signal was spurious. So there was, there was no planets yet in Barnard Star. So someone said that this is like the, the white whale of planet hunting, right? So this was there 50 years ago, nothing, and now we went, we observed the star very heavily, as you'll see in a second, and we were fortunate to announce only a couple of weeks ago that there is indeed a planet around Barnard B, or at least we believe that there is a strong or compelling case for a planet around uh, Barnard Star, and this is the neighbor we just met. So let me explain a bit, going into some detail, how the data we have, uh, the data we analyzed, and how we got to this announcement. So this was published as a letter in the Nature Journal, this was the effort of very many people. Uh, I think there's 62 co-authors here uh, from, different, from 10 different uh, countries. And this is because the amount of data we use is phenomenal. We used as, as much data as, so actually more data than any other study of, of, uh, of exoplanets. And as I said at the beginning, we used the, the Doppler technique. So we collected data from seven different, seven, seven, seven different instruments, that means as many as there are, so we, there's not a single instrument that we didn't use. These are the most precise, precise radio velocity instruments that we have now in the world. Uh, this means eight independent data sets because there was one instrument that was touched at some point and then the scale changed and therefore we have to consider two different data sets. There's measurements for a, for a period of 20 years from 1997 to 2017. Of course, I was not involved in 1997, but there are some people in the team that were, so they collected data for 20 years. There's almost 800 radio velocity epochs, so nightly averages, and this is many more than are usually used <coughs> to look for planets. And we have a candidate, as I'm showing in a second, 
that has a very small amplitude, 1.2 meters per second. At the same time, the typical error bars of these measurements are of order of 1 meter per second, 1, 1, 1 1.5 meters per second. And this is the time series. Each color corresponds to a different data set. This is the first data set, then this one, so on, and, and there's overlaps here from 1997 to 2017. And as you can see, back in 2015, already there was some evidence that someone was happening in this star. There was some, let's say, tantalizing peak uh, in, the, uh, in the data. And then we went and we really honed in on it uh, and, uh, and we took lots of measurements with Carmenes, with Harps, the design instrument to try and, and reveal whether that signal uh, is good. Now, how we do this? And let me put some, some of the equations here. What, what is the uh, mathematical uh, environment that we use? Well, we have, to, we have to do some model testing. We have to model our data putting their Keplerian signals and to test whether those Keplerian signals make sense. So our merit function that we use in this case, there's many options here, but the one we used here is the likelihood function, which is, a, let's say, one, one takes into account how likely it is that the model fits the data. Now, taking into account the residuals, one has a covariance matrix, and uh, because there's, there's correlations between the different measurements and so on, and one can test models that maximize this likelihood function, which is what we want to do. You one can use different scenarios here. You can use a white noise model, in which this is the diagonal matrix, right? And this simplifies a lot. And then we have, uh, in this expression, one uses this kind of thing. This is the, the residual of each measurement, this is the error bar of each measurement, and then we add something called jitter, because there's many error sources in the data that we don't understand, actually. But the star varies, uh, sometimes the instrument also varies, so we parameterize that by using this jitter term, which is quadratically added to each error bar. Now, this is the simplest way. We can also use the so-called moving average, in which you take into account that your measurement that there's red noise, we call it red noise, that your measurement is somehow dependent on your previous measurement because of this, uh, of stellar noise and so on. And this is, usually gives good results. This is the method that in the end we have used uh, in the publication. And the most sophisticated one, that's the, that's, the, uh, people, that's the method people use the most now, is so-called Gaussian process, in which you take into account this, co this covariance matrix, you have the diagonal part, and then some, some kernel that gives you, or models, the correlation between one measurement and the rest, let's say. Now, using this, use this likelihood function, we can try and find the models that best uh, fit the data, let's say. Uh, the models are parameterized in this way. This is the velocity of each measurement. This is the zero-point offset. We don't know what the zero-point is, so this is an arbitrary uh, uh, point. We have a global linear trend. Sometimes, for some reason, velocities increase over time or decrease over time. This may be caused by different effects. For example, a planet that has a long orbital period in the system. And then we have the Keplerian signals. This is the Keplerian equation. So this is Kepler's, uh, uh, the way they parameterize the Kepler uh, equation, the Keplerian, and which has three parameters the three preframes each, or five, depending if you use also a free eccentricity, uh, so non-zero eccentricity, let's say. So now all these parameters we fit. We fit and we, see, we test the, the goodness of the model. So for example, in our particular case, these are all the eight data sets. We have a jitter parameter in each case and a gamma, which is the zero point in each case that we optimize. So let me show you what, when we hunt for planets, when we scream Eureka, right? The Eureka comes when you see this, actually. This is the window function of the data. This is our data. This is the power spectrum of our data. This is delta log likelihood. So this is the improvement of the likelihood function for specific frequencies or periods, right? So you can see peaks here, and those peaks are periodic signals in the data. Now you have a very high peak here and some other peaks there and there's a tiny red dotted line here that is the significance threshold. Any peak that increases, I mean, that goes above this threshold, we, th we think that this is statistically significant. Now you can see there's a strong peak here at 200 something days and there's some structure here at long period as well. So without going into a lot of detail, what we did was a combined fit of a long period signal plus this 233 day signal and this is a 2D, a 
two-dimensional plot of this parallelogram. Anything that's red here means that this is a very good fit. And this is all, it's hard to see, but this is the area that we favor. 233 days plus a long period signal here. When you remove from the data, you remove this long period signal plus these 233 days, you can see here that nothing remains. All the rest that remains is insignificant. So there's two significant peaks. This one, there's something up there as well. And when you get rid of this, there's nothing significant left. So this is the so-called pre-whitening technique, the hierarchical method, which we haven't used. We haven't used this, but it's easier to understand. Lots, many of the peaks that you see here are related to one another. So you have a long period peak that may give some aliases. So by removing the long period, you remove the aliases as well. So uh, you don't remove peak by peak, you remove a structure of peaks here. So in the end, our favorite model is this long period signal, uh, almost 7,000 days, plus 233 days. And this is, the, uh, this is what best fits the data, and this is really significant. So there's a statistically a very high significance of this combination of two periods. This is what we call a delta log likelihood greater than, than 65. So this is, in other words, a false alarm probability. So the probability that this happens by chance is about 10 to the minus 15. So it's really a numerically very robust. Now, but could it be the star? So we know that the signal is there, the signal is strong, the signal is significant, but could it be the star that is responsible for this signal? Maybe it's not a planet, maybe it's the star that varies by some reason. You know, stars have star spots, they rotate, and this rotation may give rise to uh, some spurious signals on the periodogram. Now we have lots of stellar activity indicators, the H-alpha index, the so-called S-index in the calcium two lines, and also photometry. So we collected thousands and thousands of observations of this of these indices and try to look for periodicities. If in these indices we found a periodicity of 233 days, then we would be screwed, right? This would mean that this, what we're seeing, is actually the star. Now, these are time series of all these indices. H-alpha, this S-index, sodium line, some, uh, some uh, spectroscopic indicator here as well, and photometry. By the way, I have to say that some of the photometry comes from, uh, from the Monsec telescope, actually. So there's hundreds of measurements also coming from the Monsec, and it's this lat lat uh, later part that we have been investing a lot of time on. When we do the same kind of analysis, periodic, I mean, periodicity finding with this data, we, find, we tend to find signals in this area, so between 130 and 150 days, and then also in this area, the long periods. But there is really nothing significant at 233 days, which is this vertical blue line here. So from this kind of data, we can conclude that we find the rotation of the star. Barnard star is rotating with a period of between 130 and 150 days uh, in the, along, around its spin axis. And there's also evidence that there might be variability cycles, let's say, or at least at, of some kind at very long periods, right? at these thousands of day periods. But as I say, I want to stress that there is no significant signal or no, no hint of a signal at the period that we find this, uh, this planet signal, this candidate planet. One other way to understand if we're seeing activity or something else, or a planet, is to plot, the, let's say, the strength of the signal as a function of time or number of observations. If we have a stellar variability, it's stochastic, sometimes spots let's say, are coherent, sometimes they break up this coherence, and if you plot this kind of uh, signal increasing, let's say, or signal development over time, you have lots of ups and downs, because the star sometimes, uh, uh, let's say, doesn't rotate coherently, or, or, or the spots don't rotate coherently. In this case, you can see that it's a very nice curve of growth here, that the power of the signal, 233 days, goes uh, very monotonically and nicely up. And the amplitude of this signal stays very constant at about 1.2 meters per second. So there's lots of evidence that this signal is caused not by the star, but by something else. And this something else, of course, should be a planet. There's not very many explanations. Now, we, we're not happy with this, and we ran the most sophisticated test, and this is a bit tricky to understand, so just I'm going to explain, and if there's questions, we can go into more detail. This is, we simulated radio velocity series of, this, of, the, of the star. We took this Gaussian process framework, 
we use kernel parameters that we found from the stellar indicators, from the indices, H alpha uh, in this case, and we simulated from this kernel, we simulated radio velocity series. We only took those that were compatible with the observations, and then we counted how many, in how many cases we see signals similar to the ones we found through these 233 days. And this is it. This is, as a function of frequency, this is the likelihood function here, or the improvement of the likelihood, and each of these little dots here is one realization of this, uh, of this simulation. So if we found our signal, by the way, is this place here, and our delta log likelihood is about here, 32 or so. So if we found lots of signals, of strong signals in this frequency, or a majority of them with high, high power, this would indicate that, well, we have to be very careful. How many did we find up there? We found 0.8%. So uh, there's 99.2% chance that this is actually a planet, and there's still 0.8% chance that there's a conspiration, in a way, of the, uh, of the stellar parameters that give rise to this, this signal. But I have to say that this is, a lot, this is an upper limit because we had lots of sanity tests of our data. For example, this, some of the solutions that are in this area here would not satisfy this kind of criterion. So this is an upper limit and I could say we're 99.2% convinced that this is a planet signal and it's not caused by the star. But of course one has to be careful. It could still be that the star is conspiring in some way to give, to give rise to this uh, signal that we find. And this is in the end the plot, right? So this is the phase radar velocities. So this is the uh, wobble of the star. As you can see, it's tiny. It's 1.2 meters per second. Uh, there's beams. It's hard to see, but there's uh, black squares, and these are phase beams, so it's there. And there's, as I say, also a long period signal. You can see here a tiny modulation with a period of about 7,000 days. Of course, it's a period, but you cannot determine a period with this small baseline, but it's a long period here which seems to be there as well. By the way, this is very close to the period of Van de Kamp's planets back 50 years ago. Uh, we don't think it's the same planets. We, we still claim that the Van de Kamp planets are not there, but the period is very similar. We think that this may be related to uh, an activity cycle because we see also long period signals in the indices. So it's probably likely to be that, but we cannot rule out that there's something else in the system and we have to keep accumulating data. So, for you to know, this is a, a, a summary of, uh, of what we know about the system. As I said, the star is Barnard star. It was only discovered 100 years ago by Edward Barnard, who was an observer and was taking pictures, actually not pictures, was looking at, uh, through the telescope and saw, noticed this very fast moving star. By the way, this is a picture from, I think it's the DSS. And you can see here, these are pictures taken over, and different filters taken over the course of thing three years, I think. And this semaphore here, is this traffic light is Barnard Star, because it moves so fast that in the, in the interval that the different colors were taken, it doesn't line up, right? So this, you have it moved, actually. Now, the distance, as I said, it's uh, almost six light years, and by the way, it's coming towards us. Uh, in about 10,000 years, which is nothing in astronomical time scales, it will be only 3.8 light years away. So it's gonna be the closest star to our solar system in 10,000 years. A bit closer than Alpha Centauri and Proxima Centauri. Its mass, it's 0.16 solar masses and radius about 0.18 uh, Earth radii. So this is an M3.5 star, uh, a very common and classical one, let's say. A temperature of uh, 3,300 uh, kel Kelvin and a luminosity, it's about three times 10 to the minus three of solar luminosity. And it's an old star. We, it's a fast moving star. It's uh, in the thick disk population, and the uh, age of the star we estimate, and it's always a, a rough, a very rough estimate, between seven and ten billion years. So, so um, but it's again, this is not, it's very poorly estimated. And the planet, the orbital period is 233 days. The orbital distance or semi major axis is 0.4 AU. The minimum mass is 3.2 Earth masses. Uh, and the most likely mass, taking into account, let's say, if you do a statistical distribution of the inclination angles, then you get to the most likely mass of about four Earth masses. And it gets only 2% of the light that Earth receives from our Sun. So it's really a dark and red uh, place, let's say. Only uh, one-fiftieth of the, of the light that we get from our own Sun. 
And the equilibrium temperature, which could be nothing close to the uh, surface temperature, but it's still, the equilibrium temperature is, is minus 140 C, 70 C, sorry. So there's no, we don't know really what the planet is like. It's actually sitting in an area that could be either be a rocky planet with a solid surface and a, some sort of atmosphere, or it could also be a so-called mini-Neptune, so a scaled-down version of our Neptune in our solar system, so a gaseous planet. We don't know. At four Earth masses, you see both populations. Could, see, could be rocky or the other side. Well, to, put, to do all the, visual, uh, the visuals, we decided to do a, a rocky planet, so we should show landscapes and, and mountains and so on. But, of course, this could be just a ball of gas. Uh, and if it's rocky, then people ask, well, is this habitable? Well, we don't, we don't know. It's very unlikely that it has liquid water on the surface because of this temperature is next to impossible. But when can speculate, and this is wild speculation, in our solar system we also see potential habitable habit habitats in, uh, in, for example, Europa and Enceladus. So one could speculate that this could happen, the same could happen to this planet, but as I say, we have no evidence whatsoever of what the surface may be, may be like. Now, this is, would be a, a scale diagram. This is, uh, by the way, we assumed zero eccentricity in many cases, orbital eccentricity, but the, the solutions are compatible with 0.3 eccentricity. So one can have a slightly elongated orbit, and this is the star, and this is the uh, habitable zone in green. So this, this uh, planet, as I said, orbits way, way beyond the habitable zone in the cooler areas of this uh, planetary system. It's actually close to uh, the snow line of the system, which is located farther out than it's plotted here. Now, why do we think that this, why did it merit publication in a high impact journal? Why is this important? Well, it's important because it's a very nearby and famous star, and also because there may be prospects for characterization. Now, you know, I mentioned Doppler, the Doppler technique to find this planet, but if you calculate what is the amplitude of the astrometric signal on the star caused by this planet is about 13 micro arc seconds. This is challenging, but it could potentially be done with Gaia, who knows, maybe with uh, the Hubble Space Telescope, maybe with James Webb, or maybe with other facilities in the future. But one can actually observe the astrometric signature of this planet in the, let's say, mid-term mid mid future. Let's say. And the other thing is that using facilities, there may be a chance to take a picture of this planet. And this is really uncommon. And this would be the first occasion in which we could do that for a super Earth type planet, for this kind of a planet. The separation between the star and the planet is 0.2 arc seconds. So this is huge, actually. This is, uh, this is of course, it's more than the uh, size of a PSF typically, typically. But today, there's lots of instruments that can do better than 0.2 arc seconds. The problem is that the contrast of this is about 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 9, because it's really cool planet. It's really cold. And then uh, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, reflect much light because it's out there as well. But there's already proposals that we've submitted to try and get a direct image of this planet. And if not now, maybe in the future, a direct picture or a real picture can be obtained. And this would be a picture of our uh, immediate neighbor, let's say. So that's why this planet uh, becomes valuable, and it will be more so in the future. But let me put everything into even broader context and where we're going here. Uh, why are we looking for these planets? Uh, what's the uh, end goal here? Well, you know, there's a lot of momentum in this area of research these days. And this is an ESA slide that gives the timeline of planet-related or exoplanet-related missions over time. Um, Karma has mentioned Korot, Kepler K2 here, 20, 2009. The test mission, which is now flying and looking for uh, transiting planets, uh, next year we'll launch Cheops. In another seven or eight years, we'll launch Plato to find planets as well. And in another decade or so, uh, we will launch Ariel. And they're all home. They're all, let's like, say, focused on finding planets and characterizing these planets. And at the same time, there's a huge activity in the ground-based observatories. I mentioned Carmenes here, but I said uh, there's at least five or six or eight instruments being built now that can obtain these kind of high-precision measurements. And it's especially interesting to go into the nearest, these nearby planets that we try to go. Of course, the James Webb Space Telescope, although not completely dedicated to planets, also will have potentially a lot of time 
uh, invested into characterizing planetary atmospheres of these sorts. And of course Gaia here, which we expect a nice planet harvest in the area of astromatic planets from, from Gaia as well. Right, so there's, there's a lot of activity here and there's lots of missions and lots of projects that are there to try and understand this broad context of planet formation, what is the context of our own, our own planet, and then go also for the Holy Grail. The Holy Grail is finding a potentially a planet that can be potentially characterized and that orbits the habitable zone of a, of a star. So just to define this keyword, the habitable zone, that's the area around or the orbital range around a star in which we expect that the planet would have liquid water on the surface. That's the only requirement we put to habitability at this stage, knowing nothing actually. So while in the case of the solar system, this is between the orbit of the Earth and, the Mar and Mars, in the case of stars that are less massive, this actually becomes closer in. And therefore, if you go to a, a star that's about one-tenth of the solar mass, then you can go and find planets very close in with very short periods and that those are habitable. So looking for planets in the, near, in the immediate neighborhood has this added bonus that these planets are mostly around really low mass stars. They're close in and they're, let's say, their signals are stronger. And this was used in the discovery of Proxima Centauri b. This is really our next door neighbor. Proxima Centauri b is in the habitable zone of its star. It has an orbital period of 11.2 days uh, and it might be habitable. So I'm, I'm using the precise language here. What we are finding so far are potentially habitable planets, which means planets that are potentially rocky and they sit in the habitable zone. Then we have the category of habitable planets, which are the ones that have liquid water on the surface and this is a subsample of the initial ones. And then we have inhabited planets, right, which uh, we haven't found any yet, but we try to. Now, how many potentially habitable planets we have today? It's actually 14. Out of these almost 4,000 planets that we have found so far, 14 might be balls of rock that sit at the right distance of the star to have oceans, rivers, and, and seas, let's say. And of course, Proxima Centauri b is there, sitting very close to us, only four light years. There's a number of uh, additional ones. And there's some that have little stars here. And this is the bad news. These ones are, are disputed. So it might be not, not all the community think that these are actually real planets. And there's only a small sample of these that are really nearby, within 15 parsecs or so. Uh, there's famous ones, Proxima and I mentioned already. There's the collection of Trappist planets. There's the Trappist-1 system, which has seven planets, three of them in the habitable zone, and this is transiting. So this is nice because it transits. But still not quite. We still want something closer in that does transit. Why do we want these planets to transit to understand if, uh, if life is there? Well, this is the last part of what I wanted to tell you. When you have a transit, then you can investigate really deeply what the atmosphere of this planet is made of. And it's really easy to understand if you assume, well, of course, we're talking about a transit, right? So we're talking about a star and a planet going in front of the transit, blocking part of the light and therefore becoming a bit dimmer. Now, if you measure the depth of this transit as a function of wavelength, and this is planetary radius or, or transit depth, and the planet has no atmosphere, this has no wavelength signature, right? So it's a, it's a naked rock. Uh, then this planet covers a part of the star. No matter what wavelength you use, it's always covering the same amount of surface on the star, and therefore there's no signal there. If we assume that the planet has an atmosphere, so this ring of gas, depending on the wavelength you observe, this gas may be transparent or may be opaque. And depending on that, the depth of this transit, so the apparent radius of the planet, will change with wavelength. So one then, you have this kind of variation as a function of wavelength. And this is the big trick here. This is, if you have a transiting planet, then you can understand what the atmosphere is made of because you have its fingerprint, you have its spectrum, its transmission spectrum. And this, in this transmission spectrum, there's the signature of the chemical compounds that are in this atmosphere. If you are observing, uh, let's say, uh, a large planet at some wavelength, you know that at that wavelength there is an absorbent in the atmosphere that blocks part of the light. Now we do this already, and we do this so-called transmission spectroscopy, and this is a collection of, trans of transits from the same planet as a function of wavelength. 
you can see uh, different, different limb darkening variation and so on. But then, by doing this, we can actually plot stellar absorption as a function of wavelength and get this transmission spectrum. This is tricky because you need to measure these tiny changes in the depth in one part in 10 to the fourth. So that's really tricky. But we can do it today already for the easiest planets, the so-called hot Jupiters. Now, this is what is allowing us to study planets like our Jupiter, to know that there are uh, compounds like methane, like uh, dioxide, car carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, ammonia, and so on. But we want to do the same for nearby planets that are rocky. And in this case, our end goal, let's say, is to find, to look for biomarkers. And this is, this is where this, some of this research is going into, to try and measure transiting planets in which, actually, they're nearby and they're rocky and they have atmospheres, and we can measure how these atmospheres absorb at different wavelengths, and we can try and do the same thing here, right? This, is, this would be the Earth here, sorry, here. So try to find compounds like water vapor, methane, CO2, and so on. And depending on the combination that we find, this may be indicative of the presence of life. For example, if we take Venus, Venus has CO2, has CO, mostly from volcanism, has some ozone as well, and has no meth methane. While the Earth has oxygen, ozone, CO2, methane, water vapor as well, in abundance, and no CO. And these combinations of gases, they're, they're called biomarkers, and they're indicative of life because there's, um, let's say, no abiotic process that can produce them. And that's our hope for the future. So our, let's say, our timeline here, our roadmap here, is to look for nearby planets, nearby planets that are in their habitable zones of the stars, potentially find some that transit. When they transit, try and get their transmission spectroscopy and try and look for chemical compounds in the atmospheres using this technique. Barnard Star B is not the one that we can do this. Planet, let's say.